Hello everyone, I am Neil Burate, Deputy Editor at Mint. Today I'll be speaking with Gaurav Kumar, founder and CEO of UB, a seasoned entrepreneur for whom UB marks his fourth venture. We are doing this interview in partnership with UB and they have given us the freedom to ask any question relating to corporate bonds or other fixed income instruments. Today is all about understanding UB's journey and Gaurav, uh, I'm eager to hear from you. So let's get right into it. Thanks Neil for having me. Can you tell me a bit about UB's journey? So we started UB uh, three years back. My own journey in financial services space has been over the last uh, 17 years. And uh, what we realized was that uh, even in India currently, the debt markets have not deepened enough. And we started uh, UB three, three years back to build a lot of uh, digital infrastructure to deepen the uh, debt markets. Uh, so today there are three parts to UB, uh, what we call as the UB trifecta. The first part is the protocol where both sides of the market, the issuer side of the market, as well as the lender side of the market are coming and integrating with us. And once you are deeply integrated with our protocol, the protocol seamlessly provides you both intraoperatability as well as interoperatability to connect to our network. So we have over 4,000 odd issuers on our uh, network. Uh, we have over 350 odd institutional investors, uh, right from banks to mutual funds on our platform. And depending on the product which you choose uh, on the platform, we also start orchestrating the digital banking infrastructure for various parts of the ecosystem to be also functional. Uh, in, in view of that, uh, because we are the only platform today which engages with the issuers, uh, we ended up uh, setting up a fixed income platform uh, three years back in form of uh, UB Securities. Uh, we are today the largest platform on the retail side because again the view was that for the markets to deepen uh, as we saw at the equity markets as the market to deepen you need to have retail participation and that was our view because we already engaged with the issuer uh, how do we get a lot of issuance which was largely going to institutional investors also start flowing into uh, retail investors that was the vision behind uh, UB securities when we set it up back three years back Let's talk about India's corporate bond market. Let's zoom out and talk about that for a minute. Sure. Um, what are your thoughts on where we are at? So I think we are still at an inflection point compared to you know other global markets, right? So today, if you look at the debt markets in particular, especially in India, you're largely seeing most of the financing coming from banks, right? The, the markets have not deepened. Whereas if you look at the last decade or so, we are seeing genuinely the market grow. I think the market has grown 4x. Uh, so I'll more talk about both sides of the market, right? So one is on the issuer side, what will it take for more and more issuers to come into the uh, fixed income market, right? As an alternative to bank funding currently, if you look at most of the corporates, a large part of the funding has largely been tinted towards bank. Uh, if you go down the risk curve, you hardly see any form of, uh, I would say, corporate debt market existing below, uh, I would say, single A. A lot of work has been done, including our platform, I would say, in that space. But a large part of market has still been in the AAA double space, right? So uh, how do you get more and more issuers to come uh, into the market? I think a lot of good work has happened uh, from the regulatory perspective. We are already seeing the number of issuers increasing uh, of what used to be the case two years back to where it is now. You are seeing a lot of first time issuers coming into the... Any numbers on that? Uh, you have now more than 450 odd issuers. Uh, you know, who are coming into uh, and new issuers, right? And across the rating spectrum, right? So you're today seeing uh, issuers who are right from triple B uh, going up to triple A. Uh, the other form to my mind, which has been also instrumental because large part of the overall debt market or bonds to my mind was largely held by mutual funds through their specialized, uh, I would say, corporate bond funds. Uh, but what you saw, I would say, two years back, uh, definitely the the entire uh, market link debenture market uh, was a catalyst to start fueling the growth in the retail segment. So uh, that gave a impetus to the market. So you started seeing the markets growing. So roughly went to close to 70 or thousand odd crores of issuance and large part of those instruments actually uh, started going to retail. Uh, Sorry, that was 70,000 crores in total of that's MLDs. That's right. Big credit to the regulator. I think SEBI has done a fantastic job to my mind in terms of thinking through the infrastructure, right? Whether it is the development of the entire RFQ market or what you are seeing today, even with RBI coming with their own uh, uh, retail platform uh, for GSEC, right? To start seeing how do you get more and more retail participants to come into the market. 
and uh, a lot of transparency will also start coming in because of some of the initiatives SEBI has taken. To our mind, uh, some of it is very forward looking. Uh, so if you look at uh, the, just this year, the entire setting up of the entire online bonds platform because the regulator also saw, uh, you know, a lot of platforms coming in uh, into this space over the last 24 months, both on the retail side as well as on the institutional side. And uh, the regulation have been in the right direction, in fact, uh, we were one of the first ones to get the OBPP license. And what you're also seeing is a very clear mandate to integrate with the RFQ, right? Which also brings in tremendous amount of transparency, predictability. Yeah. So a lot of those initiatives, I think, have helped. And to our mind, the most important has been the reduction of uh, face value, right? From going up from uh, what we used to see at 10 lakhs to 1 lakh. I think these have, to my mind, been instrumental in terms of uh, seeing some of the depth coming in. Are you seeing an uptick in participation from them? And if not, then what is needed to drive that change from bank FDs or small savings to to some extent to corporate bonds? Uh, to my mind, I think uh, it has to be on uh, multiple vectors, right? I think one is a platform like, uh, you know, UB Security and uh, what you are seeing in, in our own brand, Espero, and many other platforms which have kind of come up, which is also providing that optionality for the retail investor to kind of invest, right? But for this market to rapidly grow, and I think we are seeing very early days of the market growth. So one is, how do you see more and more platforms coming in, which are much more easy to use? Uh, second, the great work from a regulatory standpoint of kind of deeply integrating with the uh, entire RFQ platform and then the settlement platform takes over at the exchange, right? Which is making it much more uh, reliable for a retail investor to kind of uh, come and invest. A uh, third is the vector where we are today seeing uh, the last mile, right? Because uh, a large part of mutual fund market uh, growth itself, I think a lot of credit goes to uh, the advisors and the you know IFAs who were able to expand that market, right? Because today a lot of retail investors still rely on advice, right? So today what you what we are at least uh, focusing on is that the B two B two C segment, uh, the segment which has largely helped in terms of expanding the uh, mutual fund market, uh, those are the advisors who will be able to take this. A product to the retail investor and third is obviously your channel which is going to be b2c uh, but to our mind to bring that segment together i think it's also important to invest significantly in the entire uh, generation of high quality uh, to my mind content and uh, overall knowledge base right because that is one piece of investment which we are also planning to do uh, so all of these uh, vectors coming together is what you will start seeing uh, growing the retail market significantly to buy a bond, um, what is the process? Is is it as seamless that I can open, uh, you know, I can I can buy a bond electronically in a matter of minutes? Uh, yes, you can. So you know, a platform like ours today, you know, gives you that functionality to discover any bond, uh, any listed bond which is out there, right? And the moment you are in a position to invest, I think the same process takes over, right? Because a platform like ours is like deeply integrated with the. RFQ platform of uh, BSC, so your entire bid gets placed there, gets registered there, and then the settlement platform takes over, right? So uh, it's quite seamless. So what we have also done is we have launched a functionality of uh, investing 24-7. You can invest uh, at any point of time. Now, the overall, because uh, most of the bonds Sorry, are... How is that possible? Because the market is only open in the stock market? Yeah, so it takes uh, care of your entire discovery process as well as the registration process. So the moment the market opens, uh, you know, the entire settlement process will move. Uh, in most of the cases, the bonds are anyways dematerialized, right? So the day you actually transfer the money, the you will start seeing credit of those uh, bonds in your own uh, DMAT account. So extremely seamless. So it's T plus one, right? That's yeah. right. Um, how, how do I pay for it? Is it UPI linked or uh, do I have to first edit my broking account with you? How does it work? Uh, currently, you have to do it through the broking account. I think a lot of uh, work is also happening on the UPI side. So there, a lot of capability also has to be built uh, at the exchange, right? So uh, those capabilities are also being built for uh, retail investors to in invest. But large part of the overall transaction currently happens through the overall DMAT account. Got it. So essentially, I have to first credit through NEFT RTGS the broking account and then the money gets used to buy the bond. That's correct. That's correct. And also in the, uh, uh, just also a, a sub point because if you today look at a large part of the bond market is 
privately placed listed bonds, right? So still your face value on the instrument is still a lakh, right? And if you're investing in multiple of lakhs, uh, a payment mode like UPI might not be the most effective. Where it is going to be more effective is on the lower face value, which is the uh, public listed bonds, where you can actually invest as low as, you know, thousand rupees, right? So with that endeavor, I, I think our own view is that if the face value also starts shrinking, right? I think to my mind, the overall uh, throughput in the retail market itself will increase significantly. Just to understand this concept a little bit more, private placement, um, how does it work? Like initially, is it that the bond is placed with a limited number of parties and then it is opened up to the public? How exactly does this work? Yeah, so uh, initially when uh, you are actually doing a, a, a private placement, right, the, the overall number of uh, investors are restricted. Right, so less than 200 odd investors are who can participate in a uh, private placement, right? And once that is done, once the uh, overall bond is listed and it's kind of freely transferable, then some of these investors can actually, or large distributors or IFAs can then go out and actually distribute it to the last investors. Got it. And the whole transaction then happens on the blank on the bond platform. 100%. Now, one big issue with retail investors directly buying bonds is you end up with just one or two bonds because as you said, face value of one lakh, people might not have money in the crores to invest. So how does a retail investor maintain diversification? Uh, that's a great question. And I think that's, you know, one of the uh, forward looking ask, you know, for the market to your earlier question of what will also take the market to deepen significantly because if you look at the uh, public listed bonds, right? You can actually invest a thousand odd rupees. You can have a diversified portfolio. A lot of platforms today are coming with uh, what we are calling as the bond basket, right? Where you can actually diversify your risk. You can mimic some of the most diversified funds, right? But uh, as far as private listed is concerned, I think you still have that uh, limitation of one lakh rupee. So at this stage, I think it's uh, it's a bit of a challenge to genuinely see that diversification uh, and for the regulator to really see, given that now we have disclosures which are at par between public listed and uh, privately uh, you know, placed bonds. I think once that happens, then you will see a much more diverse optionality coming to the retail investors. But currently the retail investors have to have that minimum cap of a lakh for them to invest. Now let's talk about the one thing that Indian investors care the most about. How much am I going to get? Uh, so if you can give us the rough yields for different uh, different bonds, differently rated bonds, so that our viewers have a, have a rough idea that what are the kind of returns they might expect. So currently we see a, a range anywhere between 7.5% to 14%, uh, right from, uh, I would say, triple B going up to triple A. Uh, and that's what it makes it much more attractive, right? Because we also have uh, a fairly good depth of issuers who are coming into the market, right? So you're genuinely seeing a, a very diversified set of issuers across the rating category, which also means that you have the yields, which are also in a pretty much more wider range rather than being in a narrow range of what used to early see PFC, RFC or AAA bonds, which were largely coming in between say 5.5% to 7.5-8%. But that market has already expanded, right? So. To summarize, I think between triple B to triple A, uh, that's a kind of rating category and between anywhere between seven and a half percent going up to 14 percent. Got it. Um, of course, it is much more risky to buy something that's triple B or below, um, which would essentially be non-investment grade. So for retail investors, should they just stick to triple uh, A and double A? I think what uh, what we are also seeing is largely depending on you know where a retail investor is in their own journey uh, because you know they're already taking uh, risk through equity investment so uh, genuinely taking more like a portfolio view right because uh, today a retail investor can also see 10% 15% 20% of their allocation going in high yield right within the overall uh, debt basket they have right so i think that's what we are actually seeing right that 10-15% of your overall allocation, depending on whether you are right from a family office going down to a retail investor, that's the uh, sweet spot for you to look at uh, high yield, which also entails that uh, the risks are higher for you. And the balance then can get allocated to uh, AAA and AA kind of instruments. Right, so essentially spread it out. Absolutely. Now to this mix, we have this scenario of uh, the US Fed raising interest rates. 
which may mean that RBI here also raises interest rates. And these yields that we just discussed, 7.5 to 14, possibly goes up. How do you see this playing out? I think our view is, uh, you know, twofold, right? One is the current interest rate cycle, whether it is the US or India. And I think the uh, Reserve Bank is very clear that unless and until we are seeing uh, midterm uh, overall, uh, you know, I would say consolidation and uh, inflection point on inflation, right? I think the rates are going to be high, right? So that's one view, right? So in general, the market, uh, it makes the market much more attractive compared to equity markets. Uh, but if you take a slightly more midterm to long term view, I think it's also going to be a function not only in terms of the current interest rate cycle, but also in terms of asset allocation, right? So how much of your asset genuinely needs to go into fixed income and then within fixed income, what are the real optionality for any retail investor to really uh, look at, right? So I think both of this will play out. So great time to invest in fixed income given the current interest rate cycle. Uh, our own internal view is that uh, it might continue uh, for, for some time given what we are seeing in the overall macro. The current levels of interest rate. Absolutely, the current level of interest rate. Uh, but having said that, right, because interest rates will soften and it will uh, come down if we take a midterm to long term view. Uh, but even then the fixed income instruments are going to be very attractive given the overall asset allocation diversification which every retail investor has to kind of really go about. In fact, when interest rates do come down, there will be substantial mark-to-market gains for people who have longer dated bonds, right? Absolutely. Um, so, you don't take the view that interest rates will rise. I mean, you're seeing either they'll be the same or at some point they'll start cutting. Uh, that's that's our uh, in-house view, right? I think, and that's what we are kind of uh, observing. Unless and until we again see a very different uh, uh, data point coming around inflation on account of which you might see some of the monetary policy again getting tightened. But uh, our view is slightly more uh, uh, midterm to long term as far as the fixed income market itself is concerned. Where today, you know, we, we get a lot of feedback saying that the interest rate cycle is that it's all time high already. And, you know, that's the reason why we're also seeing a lot of uh, interest coming in in terms of fixed income. While that might be true, but I think if you take a slightly more long term view, asset allocation is what will actually take over and drive the overall allocation to fixed income. So recently I was checking the earnings yield and comparing it with the bond yield. The earnings yield is the inverse of the price to earnings ratio of the stock market. Uh, and currently it sits at around 4.5-5%. The bond yield is actually higher at 7%. Uh, and what's interesting is that we are at the in the middle of a very mature stock market rally. So. Do you look at this measure? Is, is, there, is there such a thing as a bond bull market that takes over when a stock market is maturing, when an equity market is rally is maturing? Uh, in the midterm, yes. Uh, but as I said, uh, to your point, I think if it was uh, a market where I think, say, five years, ten years from now, uh, a lot of infrastructural issues as far as the bonds market is sorted, like, uh, you know, a lot of platforms being available, they're able to grow the market. Right, a lot of educative pieces and, and some of the work, great work which you and team have been doing. I, I think a lot of that coming together, right, will then start putting a, to my mind, a much more contra cycle to what you see today in the uh, equity bull run. But given that, uh, you know, those kind of infrastructure today is not available, the last mile advice, you know, awareness, uh, I, I think the markets will, in the short term, will continue to be skewed towards, you know, uh, investment in. The equities market, even though the equity market not might not be actually rewarding you, uh, and and might as you know some of the uh, you know pieces out there is very clear that it's almost at the peak of the bull run, right? So, but we are not seeing like a very high reverse allocation of asset out of the equity market, right? So, uh, not yet, not yet uh, so far. So, hopefully, I think as a platform like ours and you know uh, some of the educative work which we are doing, I think will genuinely build that kind of long term. A platform for retail investors to genuinely think through this. The goal of uh, Espero is to bring in high quality fixed income instrument to retail investors. Uh, today what we see is uh, all the debt instruments on the platform are listed. So high quality instruments varying from AAA uh, to you know triple B. Uh, also we have UPI which is enabled if you're looking at any instrument which is publicly listed where the face value is a thousand odd rupees you can seamlessly also uh, trade through 
uh, and make those payments through UPI. Right. Gaurav, so one uh, leg of uh, Aspero is that you have tie-ups with IFAs, etc. So, of course, IFAs would want to know what kind of commission they would get. Uh, so, overall, the commissions are very transparently displayed. I think it's a combination of, again, the overall rating uh, and the instrument which is being really distributed. So, that is disclosed to them very transparently on the platform itself. So Gaurav, uh, let's talk about grievance redressal. If there is a problem with any of these processes, whether it's payment or whether uh, the wrong information is showed, etc. What is this, what grievance redressal does the consumer have? So the consumer today, you know, has a 24 by 7 grievance redressal uh, where, you know, we have a dedicated team which is focused on this. And a lot of uh, questions which might come might also do, do with the entire education, right? It might not just be around payment or settlement, it might also be about uh, DMAT and, and, and getting securities in the account or you know payment and nature of uh, payments on a monthly basis, quarterly basis on the underlying instrument which you have. And there's a very clear escalation matrix uh, which has been kind of set up. So anyone who has any form of uh, grievance can directly come uh, through Espero, uh, through our grievance redressal cell and everything gets resolved within 24 hours. And ultimately, you are related by SETI, so if there's something that can... Absolutely. So, currently, uh, within the overall group, we are regulated by SEBI on the OBPP. We are uh, we also hold a merchant banking license. We also hold a research analysis license. So, uh, fully compliant and regulated by SEBI. Uh, all right, folks. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we had a very deep, insightful conversation uh, with Gaurav. Gaurav, it was a pleasure having you here. Thanks a lot, uh, Neil, for having me. Thank you.